Okay, so welcome to the first, sorry, the last, I should say, um, of the series, um, lectures on business operations. Um, particularly our focus today is going to be on strategy and competitiveness. So we, we started thinking about the strategic importance of operations in terms of where operations fits into the strategic, the tactical and the and the day-to-day -day running of, of an organisation. Today, we're going to take that a little bit for, step forward and think about how does that fit into the wider strategic planning, okay? So whilst the focus in the session on Monday was very much around the role of operations, the focus today is very much on how can operations help deliver an advantage, both competitively, but also strategically for um, an organisation, okay? So that's, that's going to be the, the fundamental purpose of today's lecture. So what do I want you to learn today? Well, a couple of things. Firstly, I want you to be able to define the role of business strategy. So I'm not going to go into too much detail um, because I do a module on business strategy separately, um, which if you haven't done already, you're more than welcome to, to um, sign up to or attend. But um, this is just a synopsis of what business strategy is, but I've made it relevant specifically to operations so you can understand what role operations plays in business strategy. So part of that we'll be discussing how business strategy is developed because that's fundamentally where operations play is a key part. We'll be thinking around explaining um, the role of operations strategy within the organization and explaining the relationships between business strategy and operations strategy. Okay, so making that link transparent and trying to understand how operations feeds into the wider success of the organization. And I also want you to be able to describe how an operation strategy is developed, okay? So understand the process of how the operation strategy evolves and emerges from the wider context of the business strategy. A um, couple more things. This is quite a heavy lecture in terms of understanding concepts and theories, but I'm hoping that by building on what you've done in lecture one and two, this should start to make sense. You should be able to start picturing how what you've learned already helps you develop this thinking. Um, but as part of that, I want to be able to identify the competitive priority. So again, thinking of that competitive advantage, how can um, operations strategy or our operations approach help us um, gain a competitive um, advantage over our competition, give us a, a unique selling point almost that makes our organization stand out compared to our competition. And more and more recently, this is becoming fundamentally important, the role of technology, okay? Technology impacts different functions. That is, I would argue there's not a single function left in an organization that isn't in some way, shape or form impacted by technology, whether it's production, whether it's sales, whether it's marketing, whether it's after sales, any, any type of function delivered by an organization, logistics, supply chain, technology has a fundamental role to play. So just thinking more broadly about how technology is, is an, both an enabler, but also something that facilitates um, how, to, how um, business and operation strategy are devised. Um, some concepts that you come across, productivity again, we talked about this briefly in the last session, so those of you that um, have either attended the lecture or viewed the recording will be um, somewhat in the know-how of what productivity is and be able to identify different measures of productivity. We'll also compute productivity measures, so how do we measure productivity and why it's um, important. Right, so without further ado, let's come back to operation strategy and why that's um, mm -hmm. fundamental. Firstly, what's the role of operation strategy? Well, essentially, the reason we do it is to provide a plan that makes best use. Okay. Sorry, can I just ask everyone to make sure that they're mute, please? I'm getting a lot of background noise. Can I ask whoever that is to put themselves in mute? Thank you. Okay. Yes, unless you're last looking to ask a question, I would appreciate if you remain in mute. Thank you. Um, right, sorry. So yes, the role of operation strategy, well, at the most fundamental level, it is to provide a plan that can help make the best use of your resources, what's available to you. So how do you best allocate your resource bundle um, in order to, to two things, to be able to identify where you're going to use them, but secondly, to actually deliver something that's of use to your organization, okay? So that plan will, 
specify the policies and plans for the organizational resources and it will also support the business strategy which i'm going to come on to um, on the subsequent slide sorry my laptop seems to have again. there we go okay so business and functional strategy so just to kind of fit this in with what we're trying to say um business strategy is made up of at the high level, three specific areas of an organization. Marketing, which also includes your sales, um, and that defines, you know, how your company is going to make money, how your company is going to reach the market, you know, what's the what, what are the variables involved in, in, in trying to make your organization successful. So that, that's one strand of your business strategy. On the very right-hand side, we've got finance strategy. Now, obviously, as you can imagine, finances are important not just the how you make money from marketing, but also the how do you raise capital? How do you deliver shareholder value? How do you ensure that you're, you're, you're balancing the books? How do you manage your budget? How do you manage your, your cash flow? All of these things are important. So finance strategy also plays a key role. But why we are here today is to focus on the middle one, okay? So operation strategy. And that's very much about everything else. So that's all about your inputs what's going into your organization. So your raw materials, your resources, um, any machinery you've bought, any land, labor, capital, all of these factors of production, all of these resources, they're going into the, the transformation process and then you're processing them and then you're coming up with an output. And all of that is encapsulated under the operation strategy, okay? So operations is quite a big branch of organizational activity and it's difficult to define you know, and when someone says, you know, I work in operations, well, they can work in many different areas. And um, operations is quite broad. Um, and unless you're set at the very top of the tree, i.e. you are the operations director or chief operations officer, um, you will belong to a specific domain within operations, whether that be production, whether it be logistics, supply chain, so on and so forth. OK, but what does operation strategy do? Well, basically, as we've said already, it develops a plan for the operations function to be able to support the, the delivery of the business strategy. And again, if anyone wants to know more about business strategy, I do run a module separately um, that focuses specifically on the nuances of business strategy. But coming back to why we are here, um, why is operation strategy important? Well, there's a few differences and probably the most essential ones between what's known as operational efficiency an operation strategy are the following. Efficiency is all about making sure that we're performing things well or performing tasks well, okay? We're doing better than our competition. But you might be saying, well, isn't that what strategy is all about? Well, yes, but strategy is different because it's also a plan for how you will start aim to compete in that market. Just because you're better at doing something than one of your competitors doesn't necessarily mean that's the approach you should take. I'll give you an example. So take for take um, the photography industry, for example, um, particularly Kodak. Now, I'm sure you're all aware of Kodak. The organization was very, very successful. If you go back 20 years, 25 years, um, when we still had wet photography. So, you know, the, the printing pictures, you would take the reel from your camera to the, the, the print shop and Kodak would print off your pictures for you. And you go back and collect them when they were ready. So you know, wet photography. Um, it still exists, but it's nowhere near as, as popular as it was. What happened? Well, Kodak became the best. They, they were the go-to in the industry. They were the market leader. And because they were so focused and fixated on doing what they were doing, they were so focused on becoming better at the process, so they were becoming more efficient. They were the best at getting wet photography done and done to a good standard. So they were very efficient, but they missed the boat on the strategy side because they, they, they never imagined or never envisioned a future where digital photography would become so important that it would almost wipe out the entire of the wet photography market. So Kodak missed the boat on that. So it was, a, it was very much a strategic failure on the part of Kodak that they weren't able to identify the significance of um, digital photography um, and by the time they did, it was too late because they lost that advantage. Other people had got to the market first. They'd consolidated their share of the market. Um, and Kodak, unfortunately, did go bankrupt. Um, although they're now back under a new trading name, um, they, they, they're nowhere near the size and scale of what they were 
20, 25 years ago. Okay, so hopefully that helps contextualize in your head what we mean by operational efficiency and operational strategy. You could have, you could be the most operationally efficient company in the world. That's not going to stop your business from failing because the strategy is important. It's about knowing where you're focusing your attention. Just because you're better at doing one element of it doesn't necessarily mean that that element is going to exist forever. Okay. Um, so things change, the market changes. And again, the role of technology becomes important. Again, technology is what's driving change. Um, in operations in particular, it's important to recognize the significance of how technology can help either make things better or certainly how technology can help change things altogether. So had Kodak maybe realized and moved towards digital photography early on, just like most of their competitors did, perhaps they would still exist today. Yes, had, they would have had to forgo their wet photography skills and technology, but that would have been a risk worth taking in hindsight um, on something they maybe would have recognized had they had a more robust strategic decision-making framework in place. Okay, so that's why operation strategy is important. If you don't have a plan for how you're going to be doing things and going into the future, you're too busy fixated on what's going on today that you're not going to realize the bigger picture. You're going to miss the boat like Kodak did. Um, and in some cases, as, as Kodak found out much to their um, demise, it can lead to negative consequences. Operation strategy ensures that all the tasks are all, all the tasks performed, sorry, are the right tasks. So again, it's about making sure what you're doing is right. Now, you might be wondering, well, what's the definition of right? How do you categorize or explain what right is? Well, there's a few different ways, but fundamentally it's about making sure what you're doing on the ground matches or feeds into the high level strategic um direction or vision okay so if the if your ceo and the board of directors have come up with a, a vision or a mission or a particular set of goals and objectives they want the organization to achieve in two five ten years time is what you're doing on the ground helping the organization achieve that whether it be in five months six months ten months or a longer term horizon what is it you're doing and how does that feed into the strategic direction that your company is taking but that's not to say that on day one you can just change everything and there you go you're already achieving the strategy it doesn't work like that it's a plan it needs to be something that's implemented over time you may have to change ways of working you may have to change your technology your production processes and these things aren't quick to implement but it's about recognizing the importance of them and without having that strategic and mindset or that strategic outlook you're not really able to achieve what you want to achieve um, longer term, okay? So operational efficiency, all about being the best at what we're doing today, but that's not good enough. It's also important that we have that long-term outlook. It's always important that we're checking, scanning the market, scanning the industry, seeing what new technologies are there, seeing what new ways of working might exist to ensure that we're not being left behind. Fundamentally, our operation strategy should help, as we've said already, devise what the business strategy is going to be. Okay, so our operation strategy should feed into the business strategy and therefore it should help dictate, should help influence what the business strategy may well be. Some of the things that you should consider um, in terms of forming that strategy is well, what business in the company, what, sorry, what business is the company in? That should say rather than what business in the company, I apologize. Um, so what business is the company in? What are we doing? What is our focus? Um, just because we're doing one thing today doesn't necessarily mean that thing is going to add value forever. Um, let me give you an example. IBM, if you go back 25, 30 years, IBM were one of the biggest hardware producers in the computing industry. In fact, the IBM mainframe was the one thing that was driving a lot of um, industry. Everyone had an IBM mainframe. Um, you know, they had the hardware, they had everything from IBM, including servers, et cetera, et cetera. But very quickly, IBM lost share to organizations like Microsoft. Um, iOS came in as well. These operating systems were newer, they were faster, they were fresher. 
Um, and they very quickly eroded some of IBM's market share. IBM recognized that they were going to be left behind and it doesn't really have the technical or the competencies to be able to compete with uh, Microsoft or um, Apple at the time um, or iOS. So instead, they became a software heavy industry and said, as everyone moved towards the Windows operating system to Microsoft and then eventually iOS, some organizations adopted, IBM decided that they'd be better off set up as a software heavy organization. So they focused their attention on application development and that's how they became a different organization. And they're still successful. They still do, you know, make a lot of money and they still do offer a lot of business services. A lot of organizations use IBM tailored applications for their organization, but no longer are they the hardware vendor than a software vendor. So again, that's the significance of strategy, the significance of having a plan. It's about understanding where are you going to compete? Where are you going to be able to create value for the customer? and raise enough revenue, raise enough money in an area to be able to keep your business going. Had IBM not taken that change, had they not made that track change towards software, who knows, perhaps they would be struggling today in the same way Kodak struggled. Perhaps they wouldn't exist um, today in the same way Kodak doesn't really exist um, in the same degree to, to the same level. Okay, so a couple of things to consider there. It's about analyzing and understanding the market. So environmental scanning. Now, these are a few tools that are useful in, again, strategy making. So environment scanning or horizon scanning, as it's sometimes called, it's about understanding what's going on outside your organization. So what we do is important and how we do it is very important too. And very much so, the focus of today should always be on what we're doing. But it doesn't hurt you to be looking outside and understanding what's going on, what the drivers in the industry what are your competition doing? What are they um, focusing on? Where are they investing their money? What type of activity have they undertaken? Um, where, you know, what technology is driving change in your industry? These are all things you're looking out for because the last thing you want is to be left behind. Okay, So environment scanning or horizon scanning is a strategic tool. It's a, it's a, it's a framework that's used to analyze the external environment. Um, it's part of your business strategy. Okay. You want to be able to understand what's going on outside of your, your specific area. And identify finally the company strengths. So these are your core competencies, or some people also might know them as dynamic capabilities. It's all part of the resource-based view. So if anyone wants to read a little bit further into that, if you look up resource-based view and dynamic capabilities, you'll come across authors such as Barney and, and David Tees. These, they're quite useful authors to read up on and they talk about how resources or a combination of our resources, whether it's human capital, whether it's land, labor, so on and so forth, and um, combined can offer our organization a form of competitive advantage. So core competencies are important as well. Where does our organization hold advantage? What can we do that others can't do? How can we leverage our resources to deliver a product or a service better than or in a in a more um, efficient manner, a more effective manner than any of our um, opposition or any of our competitors can. Okay, so that's your core competence as an organization. Again, as I said, that's leading more into the business strategy domain. So I'm not going to go into too much detail. That's just an overview. But the significance of operations strategy is we have an input into that. Okay, as an operations manager, as someone working in operations, it is down to me to make sure that I'm capturing some of these elements. And, and incorporating them in feedback or in, in, in our discussions so that when it, the time comes, the chief operating officer is fully aware of what's going on in, in our space. And there's three inputs that will go into that. So we covered these already, environmental scanning, mission and core competence, and they will help us deliver the long range plan for the company. Couple of examples I've thrown in here. So what's the example of a mission? So sticking with the IT industry, we've got Dell Computers. So Dell's mission or vision statement is to be the most successful computer company in the world. Now, some people argue they're not really achieving that because there's probably other companies on the market that perhaps are more successful than Dell are. There are other laptop um, and desktop machine uh, producers that perhaps um, you could argue on paper a larger and certainly by revenue stream a larger than Dell 
but that's Dell's mission. Okay, that's what they want to be known as. They want to be known as the most successful computer company in the world. Why is that important? Because that will then drive their focus. Okay, if not to be the most successful, they need to have particular competencies. They need to make sure they are understanding their market. They're understanding what's going on, so that they can react or hopefully be proactive in staying ahead of of, of the curve. Environmental scanning. So these are the kind of things you want to pick up on. What are the political trends? Okay, so government's important. Is there going to be a change of government? What's that? What is that government's appetite for? For technology, for innovation, for all these different things. Okay, are they going to support the business or are they going to be against the business? So what you tend to find is around election time, businesses can be quite apprehensive, particularly if there's two opposing parties, you know, directly. Um, or polar opposites in their views um, businesses tend to have a favorite and it tends to be the company that's going to sorry the party that's going to to favor them in terms of allow them and um, the time space capital etc whatever they may need to be able to do what they want to do social trends that's looking at your customers looking at people that buy from you looking at the general um you know potential population that would buy your product what are their preferences do they still want a product like the one you produce? What else would they want the product to do? Is the product you're making still um, something that's useful to these customers? So on and so forth. Social trends are important. Economic trends, fairly simple as well. Marketplace trends, quite similar to social trends. Um, and finally, global trends. So again, Lisa gave the example earlier of Coca-Cola. So if I was an operations manager in Coca-Cola, global trends would be important to me because it's not just about what's going on in my domestic market. So I'm from the UK, my domestic market would be West Europe or this part of Europe, but also what's going on on a wider scale. So Asia is a big market for Coca-Cola and Pepsi right now. That's where they make a lot of sales as well. So again, what's their strategy going to be in that part of the world? So global trends are important. And finally, core competence. Okay, so where does our advantage lie? Is it strength of our workers, the facilities that we have? Maybe it's our understanding of the market, you know, is, is our understanding of the market more unique? Um, so on and so forth. Okay. So coming back then to operation strategy and, and how we are contributing upwards. Well, in order to develop an operation strategy, it's about creating a plan for the design and management of operations functions. An operation strategy is developed after the business strategy. So once we know what direction the business wants to take, once we know what the business's plans are for the next five, 10, however many years the strategy may be for, we then start to understand, well, what does that mean for our area? How can we support the organization and achieving its um, business strategic goals, okay? So what is our role in operations essentially? And it focuses on the specific capabilities that give the organization a competitive edge. So it's about making sure that we're focusing on what's making our company stand out, specifically from the operational element, okay? So it's all about how do we become better how do we become more aligned in what we do to what the business wants to achieve so those become what's called our competitive priorities now operation strategy is all about designing the operations function okay so at a fundamental level it's about creating the blueprint for how your organization is going to run okay so this diagram is quite useful in trying to break that down for us. So we talked about business strategy quite extensively already. That contributes to what our operation strategy is going to be. So we develop the plan for our operations function by focusing on those priorities that are important. What could those priorities be? Well, these are just a few examples. Now, this list isn't exhaustive. It's just identifying some of the key ones that um, you might want to talk about. It's about cost. It's about quality of the product. It's about the time taken to get the product to the market. It's about the flexibility, so on and so forth, okay? So the, 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 there's a lot going on beyond just um, looking at input process output, okay? If you, think about, if you think about your output, you know, what's the quality of that output? 
is it good enough to go to the market or is it just going to be scrapped because you know the quality is not good enough or is it going to um is a timing taken to get the product to market too slow so on and so forth so all of these things are important as part of our operations approach to break that down further we then have to design our operations function so this is something that's developed to focus on the identified priority so whether we've chosen and um, cost quality time or flexibility we're designing a plan for how we can improve that it could be through the structure. So we look at the facilities that we have. Does the current facility set up the, the factory, the, the um, office, whatever it is you're, you're conducting your operations, does it meet our needs? Does it need adaptation? Does it need new technologies? Does it need new equipment? These are all things you should be asking yourself under structure. All about the flow of goods. So remember, most organizations today They'll have suppliers, they'll have a supply chain. It won't just be them acting in isolation, okay? Very rarely will you find us find any organization that takes raw materials by themselves from the, the fields or from the farmers or for, from, you know, directly from the oil providers, you know, if, if you need oil as an input, so on and so forth. Very rarely will they do that themselves. They'll have suppliers, people that supply them with the raw materials. They might have, if it's agricultural industry, they might have farmers, they might have and um, fruit pickers they might have all these different supply companies that are supplying them with with the products and services they need to transform to produce their output okay so thinking about the flow of goods and services how can we streamline that how can we reduce touch points how can we make our supply chain faster more efficient these are all questions to be asking and then technology so similar to facilities do we have the right technologies in place are we um you know, able to make any cost savings, any time savings by adopting more up-to-date technology, by adopting, you know, new new ways of working that technology might enable. Similarly, this infrastructure planning. Infrastructure planning is more about your planning and control systems, okay? It's more about the ways in which um, your organization is set up. It's about the logistics of your organization. Are you set up the right way? Do you have enough um workers do you have enough layers of management to be able to cover the needs of those workers you know are you a flat organization are you hierarchical all these things are important okay so it's the blueprint or the dna of your organization essentially that covers your infrastructure as well as things like who your workers are what skills they have how much do you pay them that might all impact um, on your operation strategy okay oh sorry my laptop's doing it again Okay, so why are competitive proper, um, priorities important? Well, essentially, these are the things that give your company the edge, okay? And it's four key operations questions that we should be asking ourselves when it comes to and competitive priorities. What are we going to compete on? Is it going to be cost? Is it going to be quality? Is it going to be time or flexibility? It may well be that you're competing on all of the above. Now, that might be difficult. You very rarely will you find a company that's the best at everything. You know, they've got the cheapest product or they can produce the product the cheapest. You know, they've got low costs, high quality. They're the fastest to the market and they're a very flexible organization and a flexible product. You tend to find that companies end up having one or two, maybe three if they're really strong position in the market. But very rarely will you find an organization that holds competitive advantage um, or a competitive edge in all four priorities. So again, it comes down to the operations manager and the operations team to understand where can we have our advantage? Do we have the right infrastructure? Do we have the right technology, the right people to be able to get an advantage in all four? Or do we need to prioritize one? Do we need to prioritize two? So on and so forth, okay? So an organization will, will, will learn what it can and can't do, and it will apply the best approach, the best strategy to delivering advantage, okay? So take, for example, Apple. Now, Apple products are not the cheapest. You know, Apple phones, Apple laptops, iMacs, et cetera, et cetera. They're not the cheapest devices in the market, but Apple are able to charge more because there's a perceived quality with Apple products. Okay, the reason people buy Apple products, they trust the brand, they trust the operating system, they trust the that the product um, will be well um, designed, the product will be um, 
a, a long lasting product. You know, they believe in the aftercare support Apple provide. So Apple don't compete on cost. Cost isn't really a competitive priority for Apple. I mean, yes, they're not going to charge ridiculously high money because they know that people will stop buying their products, but they know they can afford to charge more than Microsoft or they can afford to charge more than Samsung, for example, in the mobile phone market because people will still buy from them. So their focus is on quality, um, so on and so forth. Okay, so it's different ways. Whereas Android and Samsung, for example, Samsung offers its own operating system and it also offers the Android operating system. So it's more flexible. Whereas iOS and Apple, is just one operating system. So it's not as flexible. So again, there's different companies that will have different priorities of different ways of standing out in the market. And in some cases, it's about a trade-off. It's about saying, can we sacrifice cost or can we sacrifice flexibility in return for a higher quality of product or in return for getting to the market the fastest, so on and so forth. If you're competing on cost, there is a few things that um, you need to be aware of. You tend to be in an organization or you tend to be in an industry where typically you're dealing with high volume products, okay? If you're trying to compete on cost and your organization makes bespoke Ferraris, then realistically, you're not going to compete on cost. Why? Because the chances of you selling any more than three bespoke Ferraris a year is fairly limited, okay? So bespoke cars or luxury products tend to be one-off purchases. It's not something people are going to buy continuously. Whereas if you are a producer of um say for example uh, mobile phone cases so you produce mobile phone cases for apple and iphone then chances are you produce relatively high quantity you know you maybe produce 500 cases a week or 600 cases a week whatever it may be to sell to the market so at that point cost might become important to you because it's all about volume it's all about buying in bulk perhaps from your suppliers and turning that into your um your focus or your, your way of um, working, okay? Often, um, you tend to find that there's a limited product range and the organization will offer little customization. So again, if you're competing on cost, your focus is on keeping your cost down. So you probably won't have too many options for personalization. You want the product to be as standard as possible. So for example, buying a loaf of bread or buying a bottle of milk is very, very different to buying, for example, your first car or buying, for example, um, something quite large or something quite expensive. You know, if I'm going to buy luxury products, if I'm going to buy a, a pair of Christian Louboutin heels for my wife, or I'm going to buy a bottle of milk for breakfast tomorrow, these are two very, very different products, very, very different purchases. And chances are the manufacturers for these products will treat them differently. The my, Christian Louboutin will probably take time over producing the heels, especially if they're making them up as a bespoke design for me. Um, similarly, they will charge an extremely high amount compared to standard heels that I can buy from Zara or Next or one of the other retailers. So again, it's about understanding the nature of your product, understanding the nature of your industry and your customer. So you tend to find that those companies that compete on cost tend to be those that are offering a very limited product line. It doesn't tend to be very sophisticated. It tends to be very kind of basic product. Um, and it's something that's producing high volumes and they offer little customization. So I can't ask Morrison's or Tesco to personalize the milk bottle. You know, that doesn't work. That's not how, how that industry works. The, the bottles in which milk comes in are standard for everyone. You either buy it or you don't buy it, that's your choice. You may, they may invest in automation to reduce unit cost. That's an interesting one. So sometimes in order to save costs, you actually have to invest money in the first place. So some companies have realized that humans, okay, they work, they do things, they get things done. Maybe not the most efficiently, maybe not the most effectively, but do get things done. But in order, especially if you're a high volume manufacturer, time is money. You want to get as many of products onto the market as quick as possible at the lowest possible cost. So unless you hire perhaps a hundred more people, you're not going to be able to increase your production volume. So what will some companies do? Some of them will spend on automation, they'll spend on robotics, they'll spend on technology. Again, going back, this is a very kind of obscene example, but say take newspapers, for example, you go back 50, 60 years, 
you sell people physically typewriting the newspaper, okay? You would hire typewriters to sit there and type and type and type to get newspapers published. Fast forward to today, and all that's done by a machine. The amount of newspapers that were produced in one day in the 1950s and 60s are now produced in less than one hour. In fact, less than probably half an hour now based on the rate at which industry is able to operate. So, you know, it's all about thinking, how can you save money? Now, obviously, maybe you were hiring 50 typewriters to publish at the most 100 newspapers or 200 newspapers a day. Whereas nowadays, you can get 100 to 200 newspapers printed off in a matter of minutes, if not seconds. Um, so again, it's all about thinking, where do you invest in order to make savings going forward? You can use lower skills or lower skill labor. So because you're competing on cost, you're thinking about how do I keep my costs down? One of the ways you can keep costs down is by hiring people that um, don't aren't in a skilled profession. So if I'm looking to hire people to do a job, me hiring someone with 25 years experience and worked in many different industries and has held senior positions is going to cost me a lot more money than someone who's maybe only got a couple of years of experience, is still quite young, maybe still learning the trade, not quite 100% there yet, but he or she will come at considerable cost saving and I can teach them and I can, I can get them trained to, to, to do the job to my standard. So again, lower skill labor may actually be a way for you to save costs. Yes, you might be compromising on quality, but you're getting the product done. It's all about high volume. Probably uses product focus layout. So again, the focus is on how do you best get the most out of the product. And finally, low cost does not always mean low quality. So although there might well be an impact on quality because your focus is on high volume, it might not always focus on quality, but it doesn't always have to come at the cost of low quality, okay? If you can get your production process right, you tend to find, especially if you're automated, machines don't often make a mistake, okay? The, the likelihood of humans making a mistake significantly outweigh machines. So if you've got a mostly automated process, and you've got robotics and you've got machines doing the, the, the hard work for you, then the likelihood of your product suffering from low quality is very, very unlikely compared to humans. If you were to ask humans to do the exact same job, so again, low cost doesn't always mean low quality. Speaking of quality, what if you were to try to compete on quality? So say quality is the competitive priority you're going to take. Well, it's quite subjective. What I think is quality is very, very different perhaps to what you think is quality, okay? So quality can be measured in terms of the amount of enjoyment a product gives us. Is it, you know, that could be quality. Quality could be measured by the, the, the standard of the input, you know, how expensive the parts are. So a gold plated um, iPhone 12 versus a standard plastic or metal casing, you know, which one delivers more quality? For someone who's rich, they might say, yeah, the gold plated one is perfect. It gives me more, you know, more prestige. Whereas someone like myself, who probably can't afford to buy a gold plated iPhone, I'll be like, I'm happy with a standard iPhone 12. Um, you know, I don't need to pay thousands of pounds for gold plated. That's not quality. That's a waste of my money. It's not giving me value for money. So quality can have different measures. Um, quality, you know, what I think is quality, as I said, it'll be different to what you think is quality. Um, again, it's sometimes dependent on what we're comparing it to. If, for example, you currently have a Nokia 3310 and you're moving up to a Motorola um I don't know what model they're on, Motorola G8 or whatever they're called. You might think the G8 is fantastic, but someone else who's moving from the iPhone um, 8 to the iPhone 12, they'll be saying, well, a Motorola is rubbish compared to what I've got. So the quality principle is very subjective, okay? It depends on the person. Someone who's upgrading from a Ford Fiesta to a BMW will feel like, they're getting a quality upgrade. Someone who's upgrading from a BMW to a Land Rover or to a um, to a, a Porsche or something will feel like no, they're getting more quality. So again, the definition of quality is very very different. Okay, um, it just depends on the person. It depends on your customer. It depends on the on the on the contextual factor. And how you define it. Is, is quite different, okay? So there's two major quality dimensions. The first one's all about high performance. 
and we talked about that already okay so if you've got a performance focus that's one way of measuring quality okay this machine boots up in less than 10 seconds someone who needs a computer or needs a computer to you know be ready and available whenever they want that might be one of the ways in which they measure quality this car does zero to 60 miles in 2.8 seconds so someone who likes speed might take that to be you know their, their definition of quality um so on and so forth okay so performance can be one way in which you measure quality product and service consistency can be another way so for some organizations they care more about getting it right first time every time okay so for them it's about saying the quality of our products should never um be below a certain level every single product that we produce should meet a certain level so it's about consistency so no matter who the customer is no matter if you buy the product today tomorrow next week next year there's a certain level of quality that you should expect but quality needs to address a few things and it needs to address design quality okay so again if i'm paying extra money for something i'm expecting it to be of a certain standard okay so if I'm paying, for example, £10,000 for a Ford Fiesta, or I'm paying £40,000 for a brand new Mercedes Benz, there's a certain level of quality or design that I expect in that product. You know, there's a reason why I'm willing to pay more. And in return, I'm expecting, you know, perhaps a certain level of quality. Similarly, process quality. So again, I would expect that because I bought a more expensive car, that they've used better parts, they've used better materials, they've used better, you know, functionality that I would get better use of that car. That may or may not be true. I mean, you know, sometimes cheaper cars will last longer than expensive cars, but there's a perceived element of, you know, you're, you're paying for what you get essentially, okay? If I'm buying something at a lower value, then my anticipation or my expectation is that lower quality products will have been used. If I'm paying extra money, my anticipation is that better quality products will have been used. So again, quality is something that needs to be addressed when it comes to understanding what the priorities might be. It might also be competing on time. So time is all about the speed with which you get to the market. First that you can deliver. So first that can deliver often wins the race. So depending on the nature of your product, Get, being first to market is a big deal. Why? Well, the one example that we give everyone gives is Apple. Apple were the first to market the smartphone. Okay, the iPhone was the very first smartphone to enter the market. Now, obviously, Apple had a design process. You know, they they iterated, they continuously evolved, they've changed. But at the end of the day, by being first to market, Apple have almost developed a godlike status in the phone market. People trust the Apple brand. People are loyal to the Apple brand simply because they have been first to the market. They are the ones that got the technology, they got the idea, they got the design to the market first. So first time um, or first time delivery or, or, or um, first to market principles have an important impact on the customer. The customer remembers that, okay? What about time related issues? Well, it's not just about time to market. It's also about the delivery of the product. If I'm ordering something, for example, because of current supply chain issues, because of the way in which um, COVID has impacted a lot of countries, the ways in which Brexit has impacted the UK and Europe, it can take some time. For example, if you were to buy a brand new BMW to be delivered from Germany off the manufacturing production line, at this moment in time, you're waiting anything between eight to 12 weeks to get your car delivered. So you buy the car today and at the very minimum, it's going to take eight to 12 weeks, if not longer, because of Christmas, probably longer right now. But that's an important issue for a customer. A customer will be looking at that. Why would they buy a brand new BMW and have to wait three or four months if they can just buy something that's available today? Maybe there is a brand new Mercedes Benz and Mercedes can deliver it to you in four weeks. You know, that's a, that's a trade-off that a customer might have to consider. So rapid delivery is also a key part. Time is not just for how quickly you get the product out there. It's also how quickly you can deliver the product to your customer. 
on-time delivery is all about can you deliver the product as and when the customer wants it. So if you're part of the supply chain and you're delivering raw materials or what your customer considers a raw material, if you can't get it to your customer in the right time, then that's a problem. Your customer will perceive that to be a level of diminished return or a level of diminished quality because they expect you to get the product to them by a certain time frame. They expect to have the raw materials available to them to use in their production process. So that's another way in which you can compete. If you can improve the lead time, if you can get your product to your customer quicker, then again, that might sway their decision as to whether or not they want to shop with you. And then finally, flexibility. So this is thinking about <laughs> the environment, the market in which we're operating. As we know already, the market changes very, very quickly. The market for a product will never be stationary. What it is today may or may not be what it is tomorrow, okay? Things change, people's needs change. For example, the day before the UK went into lockdown or the world went into lockdown almost in March, um, you know, things were normal. People wanted to get the train to work. People wanted to consume lunch from the local shop. People wanted to go out for dinner. They wanted to go to the cinema. They wanted to do things for leisure. As soon as the lockdown started, everyone's stuck in their house. No one's going to restaurants. No one going to cinemas. They're all closed. So all of a sudden, the, the, the environment's changed, okay? How flexible your company is to cope with that is, um, is, 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 is a different question. Product flexibility is also quite important. So how quickly you can, or easily you can switch production from one item to the other. Like, again, a lot of companies nowadays will use the same facilities, the same technology to produce more than one product line, okay? So for example, take the Apple production line, the production line, they still produce iMacs, they still produce MacBooks, they still produce iPhones. Now, yes, they probably won't do them all at the same time in the one place, but in all likelihood, when there's a new iPhone coming out, when there's a new MacBook coming out, the focus of Apple's production processes or their production factories may well shift. They may well decide that you know every single factory for the next week should focus on producing iPhones because we expect to sell out we expect there to be demand. So again, how quickly you can configure your um, production line, how quickly you can configure um, what, what your workers are doing will impact on the flexibility your company has. How easily you can customize a product to meet specific requirements. So again, nowadays you have choices. You can choose what color iPhone you choose, you, you buy. You can choose what, what um, size of storage you want on the iPhone. You get to choose, um, you get even get to choose nowadays um, whether or not you want certain um, software installed, pre installed, and you can pay extra to have certain um, software configured on your device before it arrives at your door. So, again, these are all flexibility options. Okay, these are things that companies are offering their customers usually for an additional charge. And finally, volume flexibility. How easy is it for your company to scale up or scale down? Do you need um, time to be able to ramp up your production or are you able to ramp up at flick of a switch? Again, example being lead up to Christmas, most companies will experience a rise in demand for their products. So can they start producing at a lot higher volume for those few weeks or few months that they might need to produce more, okay? So ramping up and ramping down production are two key, key inputs for flexibility. But as I said, it's not always possible to be the best at everything, as you can imagine. Um, you know, people that are good at playing football, they are they're not also good at playing basketball and playing badminton and every other sport. Okay, you can't be good at everything. And the same is true for companies. There needs to be a trade-off. And the trade-off is based on a couple of different things. There's a few decisions that must emphasize the priorities that support business strategy. So again, the decision that's made it should be in line with the business priority. So for example, if your business's priority is to become the most trusted um, high quality provider of mobile phones, for example, and you start focusing on cost and speed and you don't pay much attention to quality of your product or your output, then that's a problem because 
that doesn't fit in with your company strategy. So business strategy will, to a large degree, influence what type of trade-off you go for. So you're more likely to choose quality of the product over perhaps the time taken to make it or even the cost. Okay. Decisions often require trade-offs. It's always going to be trade-offs. And decisions must focus on order qualifiers and order winners. So what do you mean by that? Well, order qualifiers are things such as must-haves, okay? The excellent quality since everyone expects it. So again, if I am buying a mobile phone from Apple versus I'm buying a mobile phone from Motorola, there are certain standards of quality, certain standards of input that I would expect from an Apple phone to be very, very different to a Motorola phone, okay? There is a reason why I'm paying more money for my iPhone compared to the standard Motor Motorola device that may be available on the market. So that's that's a, that's a way of um, describing and understanding what we mean by an order qualifier. What qualifies that order um, for me to, 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 to want to buy it? But then we have what's called order winners. Um, and I'll give you an example because Dell competes um, on, on the order winner principle. Southwest Airlines competes on cost. That's their order winner. So Southwest Airlines in America are one of the cheaper airlines. And why? Because their focus is on cost. They're like the Ryan, they're basically like the Ryanair of America. Okay. <coughs> so we have Ryanair in the UK and Europe. Um, or it's an Irish company, but they operate in the UK and, and Europe. Um, they are very much low cost, low frill airline, similar to Southwest. McDonald's operates on consistency. So for McDonald's, it's all about making sure no matter where you are in the world, when you go to a McDonald's restaurant, there's a certain level of consistency you expect. The burger, yes, there might be different flavors. Yes, there might be different toppings. But overall, the, the substance of the menu should be the same. A Big Mac in the UK should theoretically on paper taste the same as a Big Mac in Australia, in China, in America. It shouldn't be too much difference. FedEx, the delivery company, competes on speed. So these are companies that are choosing to compete on one or two areas. Okay, these are examples I'm giving you. And you can custom tailor um, your options, okay? What, what it is that you want to, 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 to focus on. How does that translate then to production requirements? Well, specific operations requirements include two generic categories. The first one is structure. And decisions relating to structure relate to the production process, such as the characteristics of facilities used, selection of appropriate technology, and the flow of goods and services. And that's what structure is all about, okay? It's about understanding how you're set up as an organization to deliver the goods and services to your customer. And then we have infrastructure. Now, infrastructure is different because that's all about essentially the blueprint, okay? It's about the plan. It's about the decisions relating to the planning and controlling of the systems of operation. So it's about making sure that you have the correct plans in place, you have the correct control mechanisms, you have the correct ways of working in place such that you can deliver on the functionality of your operations. Let's give you an example. So Dell computers, they focus on customer service, cost and speed. Their ERP system is developed to allow customers to order directly from Dell. So if anyone's bought a Dell device, they're one of the very few manufacturers where you can actually buy directly from their website, okay? And when I say directly, I mean, you can configure what you want <coughs> from their website for yourself. You get to choose, you know, a lot of different things, breaking it down things like the operating system, you get to choose the hard drive, you get to choose the graphics card, they basically allow you to almost customize your device directly from their website. The product design and assembly line allows you to make a make to order strategy. So again, based on what you choose, that's exactly what's replicated on the Dell production line. So if you worked in a Dell factory and a customer just placed an order online, you will go through the process of what they just went through and putting together the component parts to create their mobile device or their laptop device. Suppliers will then ship the components to a warehouse. So again, Dell don't actually have everything in stock, okay? So 
Dell wouldn't hold stock of every single graphics card, every single processing system, every single storage, every single metal casing for their laptops or their, their desktops. Instead, as soon as that order is placed by you, me, or whoever the customer may be, they will send out requests to their suppliers saying, we need one of these, three of these, five of these, six of these, one of this, so on and so forth. And all of that will then be delivered into a Dell facility where Dell's technicians will put them all together, okay? And that's how Dell operates. They then ship out the product using UPS. Okay, so that, that, that is Dell's way of working and that's how they deliver value to their customer. So that's their production requirement, essentially, okay? That's how they operate. That's their operating plan. And you could argue their operating strategy as well. As part of that, we have to consider the role of technology. Technology is important. Technology plays a key role in, in, in defining what an organization is going to do. Now, technology should support the competitive priorities. We're not just investing in technology because it's the latest fad or the latest trend, or you know, everyone else has got one, we should have one too. No, that's not true. Instead, your investment in technology should be based around what your priority is, okay? Where, where is it that you want to have competitive advantage? If you want to have competitive advantage in quality, then perhaps you want to invest in the technologies that will help you produce quality products, okay? So it's about thinking, where is your competitive advantage? Where do you want to prioritize your efforts and then invest in those technologies that help you deliver on those competitive priorities, okay? And there's three specific applications that are important when it comes to technology. Product technology, process technology, and information technology. So products are things like Teflons, CDs, fiber optic cable. CDs don't exist anymore. We're now on, you know, not even on DVDs or, or MP3 anymore. We're now on, you know, streaming and direct streaming. So no one actually downloads files anymore. Everyone streams them. So again, thinking about how products evolve, okay? Um, that's important when it comes to technology. The process, so stuff like flexible automation, having robots, having technology drive your production process, computer aided design. If you look at industries like design industries, engineering, architecture, computer aided design is an important part of how they come up with their plans to produce new houses, to produce new buildings, et cetera, et cetera. Information technology is important because it helps support a lot of different areas. It's your point of sale, how you sell to your customer. No longer do many customers use hard cash or paper cash. It's now all about using your, 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 your debit card, your credit card. Some people don't even use that. Some people use their mobile apps, you know, just tap your phone and pay from your phone. So again, what does your point of sale look like? What IT systems do you have in place to support your customer? EDIs, ERP systems, enterprise resource planning systems, and business-to-business -business models as well. So again, it's no longer just about selling to customers. Some companies are set up only to sell to other businesses, um, you know, supply chain organizations, ones that only sell to other businesses. So, you know, I might be a producer and seller of raw materials, so I'm only going to supply raw materials to a business. I'm not necessarily going to sell raw, raw materials to a um consumer or customer like you and I. How do we use technology for competitive advantage? Well, technology has positives and negative potentials, okay? Positives being they improve your processes. They can make things better. They can make things faster. They can make things um, higher quality. They can improve your time to market. They can even improve the flexibility of your product. Machines can do things that humans can't. So perhaps, you know, the, the flexibility goes up because the machine all of a sudden can offer new functionality. It's about maintaining up-to-date standards. So again, you know, for example, take the, take the accounting industry, the accounting practice. If you're an accountant and you're still using ledger books and pen and paper, then chances are you're very much behind the rest of the industry because at the very least, everyone's using um, some kind of um, online um, accounting system, whether it's SAP, or something different, a different um, CRM. There are very many different ways in which accounting is done electronically now. I don't think there's anyone I know that still does manual ledger, apart from perhaps single sole traders, people that you know 
operate small businesses that might still want to keep a day-to-day -day record. But generally speaking, accountancy or accounting practices are all done using technology. They're done using um, numbers, um, spreadsheets, et cetera, et cetera, rather than traditional pen and paper. So again, it's about maintaining the standards. If you were to produce a paper and copy of your accounts and submit that to Companies House, they probably would refuse it, I think. I, I don't think there's many companies that submit their, their accounts um, via post or via paper and pen and paper to Companies House in the UK anymore. Technology is also a way of obtaining your competitive advantage. Okay, so again, it's about saying, how can technology improve my competitive priority? How can it make me stand out? How can it give me the edge? However, technology has some negative implications too for your company. Number one, cost. So again, yes, technology gives you benefits. Yes, it can improve your processes, make you more efficient, make you faster. But that comes at a cost. And that cost generally tends to be monetary in terms of financial costs. But there's also a risk as well that, you know, yes, technology is all well and good, but only when it's used properly. So if you don't have the skill in your company, you don't have the skilled labor, the skilled uh, resources to be able to operate the technology properly, then it may actually hinder the process. So yes, investing in technology can save you money in the long run, but only if you then have the skills and the capabilities in your company to be able to cope to be able to deliver on what the technology can do. There's no point in me investing in the latest technology to make, um, for example, laser um, optical surgery when I am not a surgeon at all. I don't know what surgery is. I don't know how it operates. So if I was to open my own um, practice where we offer laser surgery treatment, then me investing in technology would be a waste because I don't know how to use it. Unless I have a surgeon or someone with a technical background who knows how to use that technology, it's just going to sit there and go to waste. Okay, So there's a risk that the benefits, although they're available, they're only available if other things are also in place. In general, your technology should support your competitive priorities, okay? Your investment in technology should be done so that you're actually trying to become even better at what thing you hold your advantage in. Sometimes it may require a change to your strategic plans. Technology might come out that changes the way in which something works, a fundamentally change So for example, going back to Kodak example, wet photography was, was the focus. 25 years ago, all of a sudden digital technology comes along and there's a potential for digital photography. That's a game changer. And at that point, it should have changed Kodak's strategic plans. Unfortunately, Kodak didn't pay much attention. They thought it was just a fad, it would soon disappear. Unfortunately for Kodak, that didn't happen. Digital technology went on to dominate and Kodak went out of business. So technology can sometimes require your company to change their strategic plans. Other example being VHS, I'm sure you all remember, um, particularly those of you that are maybe 20 plus will probably know what a VHS is or a VHS tape. They went out of business because DVDs took over. Everyone has a DVD, but nowadays no one has a DVD player either because everyone streams their content online or they, they're able to access whatever they want to watch online, their favorite movies, they're able to stream them from Netflix or Amazon Prime. So again, it's about recognizing how technology is driving change and why you as a business need to change your strategic plan. Also, it can require changes to your operation strategy. So technology might actually lead to you changing your operating plan. So again, you might have forecasted for a resource of an extra 150 people to help ramp up production for Christmas. Instead, you've now been delivered state-of-the-art new robotic technology that replaces the need for you hiring 150 people. In fact, it even lets you cut down your existing workforce by 50 people because you know you no longer need them. The robot can do the job and the robot can work 24 hours, unlike humans who can only work certain times. So again, there's ways in which technology will change not only your business strategy, but also specifically your operation strategy. But technology in itself 
let's not forget, is an important strategic decision. Okay, the decision to invest in technology isn't one that's made, generally speaking, by one or one com one M sorry department or one person. It's made by a combination of people, generally speaking, quite senior in the business. Productivity. Um, we're not far off finishing, so I'm, I'm going to skip the break rather than taking a break here, if everyone's okay with that, and we'll finish earlier than planned. Um, measuring productivity is important. So productivity is a measure of how efficiently inputs are converted to outputs. Okay, We said that on Monday as well, so productivity rate measures your output divided by your input. The total productivity measure is usually based on costs. So total productivity is the amount of money or dollars that you can make in sales divided by the total money that you've invested in your inputs. So the output, how much I'm selling my output for, divided by the amount of money that's gone into the input. So the, the, the raw materials, the labor, et cetera, et cetera, that measures my total productivity, okay? In an ideal world, that would be greater than one because then I'm making money and I'm, and I'm actually generating value properly for my business. Partial productivity measure is looking at things such as the number of cars we have relative to the number of employees. So for example, I'm BMW, how many cars can I make per day, per week, per month, per year, divided by a number of people that work for me across that same time period? That's a way of measuring it. So it could be that for every 10 employees we have, we make one car or we make five cars for every um, 350 employees, so on and so forth, okay? So it's a way in which you can break down, you can compare. It's a ratio almost of how many cars, how many um, milk bottles, how many mobile phones you can make. And that can be per employee, that can be per um, per pound spent, per, it basically is a ratio of, of any two productivity measures. And finally, we have what's called a multi-factor productivity measure. Now, that's slightly different because what that is doing is that's dividing your sales by your total costs. The total costs are different to your inputs because inputs are specifically focused on what's going into your organization. But total costs, everything, it's not just the cost of your inputs, it's also the cost of transforming the products. So that processing element is also the cost of you storing it in the warehouse and inventory. It's also the cost of you selling it, you know, you're paying rent to hire a premises, so on and so forth. Multi-factor productivity measure tends to be in the zero points, okay? If you have a multi-factor productivity of one over, of greater than one, then you're either charging an extortionate amount or your total costs are extremely low. You tend to find that multi-factor productivity can even be 0, 0.0 something. And that's fine because as long as it's not negative, it means you're making money, it means you're making profit. Okay, because your total costs are lower than your total sales. Uh, most companies will have a positive multi-factor productivity rate, um, but it doesn't really tend to be greater than one. It tends to be zero point something, but that's fine because zero point something of a hundred million is you know over, over more than enough to, to to generate value for your company. Um, we've got some examples here um, just to kind of take us through what I'm trying to say because I appreciate that it can be difficult to understand measures or productivity measures without having examples. So here's a productivity example and I apologise in advance for the font, you can't quite see it clearly, but I'll read it out for you. So an automobile manufacturer has presented the following data for the past three years in its annual report. As a potential investor, you are now interested in calculating the yearly productivity and the year-to-year -year productivity gains as one of several factors in your investment analysis. So you might be an investor looking to perhaps invest in this car manufacturer, automobile manufacturer, and you've just been looking through their accounts for the last three years. Let's assume we're back in 2004. So if you look at the numbers here, the unit car sales have been going up. So they've gone up from 2,100 to 2,400, and then eventually 2,700,000 by 2003, okay, so incremental rises of 300,000 each year. So that's good, steady steady growth in the number of cars being sold. Number of employees has actually gone down. So between 2001 and 2003, we've actually reduced our employees by 3,000. So fell by 2,000 between 2001 and 2002, then fell by a further 1,000 between 2002 and 2003. 
So the number of employees has gone down. The sales that we've made in billions has gone up, as you can see. And finally, the cost of sales um, has also gone up. So what does that mean for our productivity? Well, if you use the partial productivity measure, then number of unit car sales divided by a number of employees has actually gone up, okay? So for every one card that we make, in 2001, we needed 18.3. In 2003, we're doing 24.1, okay? So that's how many cars we're able to produce per employee in 2003 compared to 2001. So per employee, we're now making more cars across the year. The year-to-year -year improvement, as you can see, okay, it's not as great in 2002, 2003, but it's still an increase. So it went up 15.8% between 2001 and 2002, but between 2002 and 2003, it went up 137 so again, as an operations manager, I'll be looking at that and saying, good, we've been able to increase the number of cars we're making and reduce the number of people we're employing. So it's a positive net outcome. You're saving money because you're not employing as many people and you're actually gaining because you're making more cars. If we now look at multi-factor productivity, the total cost of productivity, so your unit cost, so here you're multiplying the sales in billions divided by the cost of sales. You're getting an, a positive multi-factor productivity rising from 1.19 in 2001 to 1.26 in 2003. So from an operations perspective, again, you've got a year-to-year -year improvement. So if you were then operations manager presenting your findings to the board or to senior management team, you could be pretty satisfied with what your company has done or what you've done in your area because clearly you've been able to increase productivity. You're now making more cars per person per year. And you're also, um, your multi-factor productivity suggests you're actually generating more revenue um, per unit cost. Hopefully that makes sense to everyone. Anyone got any questions on those calculations? I just wanted to give you an example so you could see how these um, formulas um, are brought to life with numbers. Okay. How do you understand them then? So how do you interpret productivity measures? Well, productivity measures must be compared to something, usually another year or perhaps a different company. So you might compare year to year as we just did, how have things improved? Or you could compare yourself to your competition this is how we performed this year. How did our competition perform? So there's two ways in which you can look up productivity. Raw productivity calculations do not tell you the complete story unless there are no major structural differences. So again, the actual high level figures, they might not mean anything. Why? Because the context is important. For example, if you were to compare for most companies, the productivity between 2019 in 2020, you will see that the productivity sharply declined. Now, on paper, that looks like, oh my God, the company really struggled, it did really bad. But contextually, so did everyone else because COVID hit, you know, the markets were pretty much dead. Everyone stopped working, lockdown started, there was no productivity. So, you know, the, the context is important. So just looking at the numbers on paper is not enough. You have to provide context. Similarly, one company might have decided to invest in new technology that's going to save them a hundred million pounds over the next 20 years, but they had to invest say 50 million this year in the technology. So they might look as if their costs have gone out of control or spiraled, but you have to take that into context. What does that mean for how their costs will now decrease going forward? So just comparing numbers sometimes isn't enough. You have to look at the context. In the prior automobile business example, it is obvious that some major changes were taking place in order for us to get 15.8% and 13.7% year-to-year productivity improvements. What changes could improve the car sales per employee? So for example, the company may have invested in automation, i.e. more robots, so you could reduce the number of humans you have. So therefore, your number of cars produced per employee would naturally go up. Um, Maybe you outsourced, 
okay so maybe you, you rather than hiring people yourself you're paying someone else so they don't count as your employees maybe you had a major redesign and you decided that you don't need certain job functions or job roles anymore you know you can just source the components from a supplier you don't need people in your company to make that component anymore so again there's a few different ways in which we can interpret statistics a few more questions you might want to ask when looking at productivity measures other productivity measure questions such as is this partial productivity measure enough to make an investment decision so again your board will want to know we want to invest 50 million pounds in improving our operations where do we invest it well is the partial productivity measure that you've produced for example number of cars per employee is that enough information for them to make that decision or do you need more information is the total cost productivity measure a better reflection of the year-to-year -year productivity so in the car example we saw that you know between 2001 and 2002 it went up by 4.2 percent but between 2002 and 2003 it only went up 1.6 percent is that maybe a better way of thinking about productivity if so why compared to just number of cars made per employee so again that's for you to argue and for you to discuss should you also maybe look at productivity measures for the last for so for, sorry for two major competitors for comparison so again say you're bmw you've looked at your own figures and this that's what you've derived but you might want to look at mercedes-benz and audi because they are relatively speaking compatible um, car manufacturers that might be useful to understand how they performed what they've done is it different to what you're doing has their strategy been something different has their strategy delivered the more or less success productivity generally speaking measures sorry productivity measures generally provide information on how the firm is doing relative to what is critical to the firm okay so your productivity measure is a way for you to assess or see how well your company is performing relative to what is important to your company your productivity and competitiveness for example in the services sector so this is based on the us um, statistics here the us productivity growth averaged around about 2.8 percent between 1948 and 1973 however for the next 25 years after that it slowed down and it slowed for around 1.1 percent and then it picked up again from the, the 2000s so again that was a stock market crash if anyone if anyone um, is aware it's the sorry the dot-com bubble burst in the year 2000 and um most countries went into a state of recession um, in the year 2000 start of the new millennium before picking up again in productivity so again you can map the competitiveness of a country you can map the competitiveness of a sector you can map productivity etc as well it's a unique challenge because there's different ways in which you can measure your outcome for example for countries gross domestic product tends to be the big measure for productivity but there's different ways in which that can be done as well okay so measuring intangibles is quite challenging and making sure that each company is doing it so each country sorry is doing it the same way is a challenge in the same way that making sure each company is accounting is the same way is also different what you classify as expenses or write-offs might be very different to what my company classifies as expenses or write-offs so comparing can sometimes be a difficult challenge generally speaking um operation strategy across the organization well the business strategy is important because that gives you a long-term plan okay we talked about that already that's what your company is looking to achieve overall but your operation strategy to support the business strategy is important because as the operations manager you have the say you have you have some kind of control some kind of input into how the operations will perform relative to that business strategy so you will support the business strategy by making sure that the operations on the ground feed into what the the organization wants to achieve that business level in the same way the marketing strategy needs to fully understand operations capability so for example our marketing team can't claim our product does x y and z if it only does x on its own okay so the marketing strategy depends on what your operational capability is so it needs to be clear to the marketing team and the marketing manager 
what you're doing in operations and how your your output can be marketed. How can sales be improved? How can they advertise your products? In the same way, the financial plans will, in effect, support your operational activities. Finance team or the finance manager needs to be aware of what you're planning to do, how much investment might be required, so that he or she can create the necessary conditions, can can tailor um, their budget, can start to understand where the money will come from to fund your operations. So the one thing that's important is business strategy is made up of these three component parts, but these three component parts do not exist in isolation. They have to talk to one another in order to deliver the business strategy. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the end of today's lecture as well as the end of um, the module. So just to recap, we've covered an extensive amount of detail in this class. We started by looking at operations in general in week, well, sorry, last week in lecture one. We tried to understand, you know, what the role of the operations manager is, how the operations function is quite large. Last lecture on Monday, we started thinking about operating plans and why operating plans were important and the role of um, sales and operating plans coming together. And today we try to tie that one level up and think about the role of operations management and operations planning and operations strategy within the context of the wider business. So hopefully those three lectures have given you a better idea of what operations management is, what it does and why it is important. Um, and I guess that's it for me. So I'm going to open the floor to any questions you might have. So please do feel free to come off mute or to share any ideas or thoughts in the chat. If anyone has any questions. No questions from Lisa, okay, thank you. Okay, well, if everyone's happy, then um, I will thank you all um, and please do feel free to join the other lectures that I am running. As I said, business strategy is one that I do here um, at LSBR, but there's other modules too. So I'll look forward to seeing you um, in some of my other lectures. So thank you very much for your time and hopefully see you all soon. Bye for now.